everybody, Raul here for Bass Musician Magazine, and today we have the immense honor and pleasure of chatting with someone who needs no introduction, the extraordinarily elusive Mr. Mike Pope. <laughs> you find me at home, apparently. There you go, there you go. It's nice to finally be doing this with you, Raul. This is cool. So. Oh, our pleasure, Mike. It's We've been talking about this. The reason I mention elusive is because Mike is one of these guys that is a master of the hustle. He is like white rice. He is everywhere. And I am always just in awe of that. So pinning him down in one particular place, you really just have to know the, the schedule and the scorecard. So we've done a really cool piece, and we're going to have, we're going to be sharing a big piece of a day in Mike's life, which will be attached to this interview piece. So you can kind of get an idea of what it is like on his educator at Berkeley side. And it's it's enough to, again, I spent the day with them uh, looking at this video, and I'm like, oh my gosh, this is just so much, and this is just one day. So <laughs> it's, it's extraordinarily impressive. But for all practical purposes, as always, we like to kind of go back into the past. Mike, how did you get started in music and on bass? My parents are both classical musicians, concert pianists. And I just grew up in a house where music was a part of the daily communication, you know. Being a musician was a very organic thing. It was, you know, we'd go to movies and my mom would come home and go straight to the piano and have all the songs memorized and learned and be able to just play them on one hearing, you know, because that's just the way she was. My, you know, my dad would be drinking a Cuba Libre, watching the news and analyzing Bach that I'm playing in the other room, you know. It's just, that was the kind of thing that happened in my house and it all seemed very normal to me. So I played the piano from a young age and then fast forward to age 11 or so and my brother Dave had gone off to college and when he would come home we, we had these two acoustic guitars and when he would come home we would play tunes that we had both lifted off of like Pat Metheny records or whatever and he was into guitar so I learned the bass parts and I, I just had an affinity for it I don't know why I just did even when I would write little arrangements on the piano I always wrote bass lines and then chords with the melody on top you know rather than you know, chordal accompaniments. It was just, I don't know why, but it was just something that I gravitated toward. And ultimately he convinced my parents to buy me a bass and they did. And remember it was a Kalamazoo bass, which I think was like the, like the B grade of the B grade. I think it was like Gibson and then Epiphone and then like whatever they swept up off the floor was Kalamazoo, you know? And it was a horrible instrument, but it had four strings. And Theoretically, that's all I needed. Yeah. Anyway, but uh, so, <laughs> yeah, and I just I started playing. And then, you know, and when my folks got me a really amazing teacher in, at the university there in Bowling Green State University in Bowling Green, Ohio, mm -hmm. named Jeff Halsey, who was, it, he was a tremendous musician and bassist and was a, I, I don't know, I could have could think of a better teacher. I mean, he really taught me how to be a bass player. He had me play an acoustic bass within, it was kind of a condition. It's like, I'll teach you electric under the condition that in the next year or two you start studying string bass. And so I, I, I did. Anyway, he really set me in motion in exactly the right direction. Mm -hmm. So um, that's kind of how it began. And then from there, it was just the organic play with this one, play with that one, get yelled at, screw this up, rush, drag, lose the form, blah, 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 and then learn from it and, you know, just try to avoid getting your butt kicked. So that, that was, you know, the, pro the normal process ensued about the, by the time I was about 14 and I was actually playing with professionals and making music so wow in spite of the fact that you already had such a strong beginning out of the gate because again you're surrounded by musicians you would get the whole theory and a lot of that stuff grained in at such an early age obviously if you're playing Bach I mean you know there's a lot of detail that some people wouldn't get to in a lifetime you still pursued formal studies uh, in North Texas mm -hmm. yeah yeah I went to University of North Texas which had been called North Texas State until a year or two before I went. So that was what everybody, my, when I was a kid, everybody talked about North Texas State. And then they thought it was more prestigious to be called University of North Texas. So yeah, I went to North Texas, loved it, got a great education there. Was, I had a really charmed career there. I got in the one o'clock band in my first semester when I was just 19 years old and I stayed there for three years. So I got every 
opportunity that anyone, you know, any, any opportunity that could be afforded to somebody there, I got, which meant playing with the top group, playing professional gigs with the top group, playing with all of the artists who came through for what they call their lecture series and any of the other clinics and what have you. So I was exposed to the, the very best that North Texas had to offer. So I got a lot out of it and developed some relationships with like Michael Brecker, for, for example, was one guy that I, I got to know well there or started to get to know well when I was there because of a clinic. Yeah. So I did pursue formal studies and then played and played and played. And then I you know, decided after a few years ago, I decided to go back and get a master's degree. So I did that at Towson University here in Maryland. I got a very, very, very good. I, I was mainly there to study classical you know, string bass because mm-hmm. I'd slacked off on that too much over the years. And, you know, when you look at the bass players that are out there now who are at the top of their game, the Patatucci's and the Chris McBride's and the Scott Collies and the younger guys like Matt Brewer, and the Ben Williams and the people of the world that really play the instrument really, really well. Linda O oh is another one. She actually is joining the faculty now at Berkeley, which mm. I'm really excited about. She's a brilliant, brilliant player. These people really know how to play the instrument, <laughs> like just play the instrument. Never mind the stylism and any of that. So I felt that it was probably necessary for me to go back and figure out what I had missed. And there was a lot. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so I got my butt kicked. But I had a wonderful teacher there, too, a local guy, a guy from, uh, originally from Ukraine named Victor Devoskin. And he, he, was a, he was a real find for me. He was a good balance between being mindful of where I came from and what I'd done and also mindful of holding my feet to the fire <laughs> to do the work and mm-hmm. get better. So I was very thankful for that because a lot of guys I ran into were either like, yeah, you don't need to learn anything or were like, you'll have to be treated just like an 18 year old. And I'm, like, I'm not, I'm not going to do that either. So I found a good balance and it was great and I couldn't have asked for a better situation. So basically I learned what I did. I, I learned enough to learn what I don't know. I still don't know, but I now I know what I don't know. <laughs> mm-hmm. So, I mean, that helps. So that's been, I, I'm, you know, I guess for a lot of jazz musicians in particular, the, the learning process doesn't ever really stop. You're always kind of in school. So And you are one of the unique individuals that in, in the bass world, and I have a contact with quite a few of them, that can double up and be as proficient on upright as on electric. Our cover from this particular month, we're in August when we're talking, end of August, Reggie Workman, who is 82 and a monster on upright, but he says he they've tried to get him to play electric once or twice, but he's going to just leave it to guys like Victor and... And, and, and other kids like I don't I don't need to mess with it. They're they're doing a fine job of it, so why should I bother? You know, sure. but, but you're picking up on on both things, which is just it blows me away because they are so different. Yeah, it's like they're the same, but they're really different. Yeah, I mean, and idiomatically, they're they're vastly different. At least traditionally, mm-hmm. they're idiomatically very different. I mean, you know, more and more, I'm seeing I probably largely out of necessity, I'm seeing groups that are ostensibly jazz groups that really that are like traveling with electric bass. And I think that that's partly because traveling with an acoustic bass has become so incredibly difficult, particularly mm-hmm. when you're going to Europe. And, and the instrument is well, it's not that old, right? So I mean as it as it as it evolves more, it, it it starts to do more things as people do things more things with it. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm still really shocked at the number of jazz programs at universities around the country that don't have electric bass as a principal instrument just absolutely blows my mind I, i'm like why would you do that that's that's i mean the, the fact remains that the you know a young bass player is going to make most of his money his or her money playing electric bass mm-hmm. if, if it if, even if it's just a matter of paying for groceries as you go through college i mean that's really most likely that's the quickest easiest lowest drag not take time away from your studies way to to produce income and moving forward I mean, every every gig that i've ever had that's been substantial with the exception of the chick gig it has been oh, probably the exception of the miola too but I've, so many gigs that i've had over the years have been because i play both bases mm-hmm. i mean that's been a big big factor and it's a factor that i can't I can't understand why you would just want to take that advantage off the table just in the interest of what being a purist. I don't I don't know why, but it doesn't make any sense to me. 
But. I agree. And I think in the educational system and having been through a lot myself, it's only after the fact when you're, you know, 30, 40 years after you've finished taking, getting some degree or something that you look back and you go, why the hell did they make me take this class? I, mm -hmm. I've not used it as of, as of yet, you know, <laughs> so what was, what was the reasoning? And, and I know at the time they used to just kind of come back and go, oh, you'll be a much more rounded person if rounded, you, yeah. if you have this. And so what reason was there for me to take gymnastics? I was never a competitive gymnast. Mm -hmm. I, uh, <laughs> the first day they told us, don't get any ideas that you're even going to be a gymnast. It's too late. You're in college. You should have been doing this 10 years by now. Right. So basically, we're just going to teach you how not to kill yourselves uh, on, on the mats, you know. How to fall effectively, one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah. Exactly, you know. And so I could have been spared banging my head on the parallel bars with, or just said, oh, yeah, I, I'm not right for it. So, but you why? You go in the practice room and bang your head against the wall like I did. I, I know. <laughs> I know. And so part of the thing is many, much of the educational system holding on to that general concept of, well, that's how we've always done it and or the excuse of it used to be worse. That was the one that always slayed me when I was snowed under an academic pile and, and for them to go, why are you complaining? It used to be worse. And I'm like, well, that shouldn't make you feel any better. It's still not good. We need, it it well, needs to adapt. And well, and, and especially especially when you look at the at the trajectory that that the music business has been on, whatever that is, mm -hmm. and just what trajectory I don't even know. But you look at what's been changing in the music business, and also when you look at education, not just college education, but even when you look at particularly wow. public education, high schools. And with my oldest just graduated last uh, June, and she's now at the Manhattan School. Uh, Manhattan School of Music up in New York, studying with a brilliant, brilliant classical uh, opera singer, Emmy Award winning opera singer named Catherine Malfitano. It's a really big deal. So she's up there, but they both have gone through the high school. You know, well, my, so my, my younger is just a year younger, so she'll graduate. She's a senior this year, and she just got her driver's license. God help me. But um, <laughs> so, so um, uh, but, but in, in, in seeing how these kids, now, they went to different schools because my oldest went to the Baltimore School for the Arts, which is a little bit like the Fame School, LaGuardia mm -hmm. School in New York. It's Baltimore's answer to that. It's a public school, but it's like a magnet school. And their academic achievement is off the scale, and the musical part of it is amazing. Well, it's not just music because they do visual arts, so dance, and you know all, all, all kinds of stuff, act and theater. I would say that it's worse now in terms of the amount of work. I mean, these kids are like... The amount of work that they put on these kids and, and, and the, particularly the pressure that they put on them for like to take like AP classes and things, which can be really hard, man. Yeah. And, and they say, well, if you don't take a bunch of AP classes, then you're not going to get into a good school and this and that and the other. And I mean, I'm sure there's something to that. But at the end of the day, these kids are working themselves into a freaking depression and anxiety. Yeah. And that stuff happens sometimes just on its own. But there's no question that it happens sometimes because you just work yourself into a into a, a, a frenzy. Mm -hmm. uh, it's difficult to see. So it's I don't. I mean, I think that things are for. I think things for young people these days are, in a lot of ways, harder than they were for me. Granted, you've got Google now, and you and information is much more readily available, and that helps a lot. But then again, you know, there's a lot of kids that don't have enough of a basic understanding of physics to be able to figure out how to change a tire. Yeah. So, uh, and you know, and that's not good so or they don't they couldn't locate their state on a map or you know just just general knowledge is just like not there yeah and um i know that, that a lot of what i've accomplished outside of the music world has been because of just because of general knowledge all my work with federa and th there's been no education really associated no targeted education associated with any of that you know that's gotcha. just been what i knew and what i was able to surmise and then it, at least not having enough general knowledge to lead me to a place where I knew I needed to ask a question, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> and being fortunate enough to have people that I could ask that, that would give me a right answer. But uh, in general, yeah, that whole that whole the whole education thing is really, and I just mean again, I'm just really talking about public education. Yeah, really, 
because you can't really get away from that. You know, it is what it is. I mean, the policies are the policies. They tend to be pretty broadly implemented. You know, it's not just one school district. It's kind of all over. I don't know. It's interesting. And of course, the music business is changing like crazy anyway. So who in the heck knows what's going to, you know, what's going to happen with that? But I just want to make sure my students, my students who are the generation that are going to redefine this business, whatever it's going to wind up being, I just want to make sure that they know where they're coming from. This next generation to land somewhere with that's informed by everything that happened before them. Informed by, you know, I, I'm not a purist and I don't think that people should be, should do things the way they've always been done, but I think people need to know how things were done. Gotcha. Anyway, I, I've, I've completely digressed into a whole other thing, so sorry. No, but no, this is fabulous because part of it is one of the hats that you wear is as an educator. Mm -hmm. And it, you're in a position where you can influence the future generations and you tailor how you approach it. And I think in a very realistic way is like, okay, what do I need to give you? How, what do I need to impart? What do I need to tell you in order for this to, to work for you? Mm -hmm. Instead of this is how we always do it. This is just what you need to... to to do, you know, otherwise, again, we'd be teaching loot at the, at, at the, at the school and, and saying, well, you know, they, that's all they used to play or clavichord or let's, let's right. just dig back and bang yeah, and on if, a trunk. If you're getting a degree in classical guitar, it probably makes sense to maybe learn a little bit of loot or at least some loot repertoire. But, you know, I mean, but, but it's, it's a, it's a relevance thing, but yeah, because for sure we're not teaching in terms of op playing opportunities. Mm -hmm. So, you know, things aren't, they're not what they used to be. And there's still a lot of good playing to be done, but there's no question that, you know, somebody can be a young, hot, new item who's out playing with everybody. And that can just go like fury for five years or maybe 10. It, there's never an automatic like, okay, I've crossed this threshold. Now things are on their way. It just that doesn't really seem to happen that way anymore. People still have to continue to work and work and work at it. To make sure that things keep moving more so than more so than before, because there was a time that once you played in Miles's band or or maybe Art Blakey's band, you know there was a certain there were certain things that bumped you up to a certain level and you were there, you know, yeah. and you could pretty much expect to stay there unless you just screwed up, you know, like uh, you know just made big mistakes. But that's not really the case anymore. So you know we're not teaching, we're not educating students for the same reasons that we were. <laughs> And certainly there's not a lot of teaching gigs left, you know, I mean, just there's not not much opportunity, especially when you've got college teachers, college educated teachers working three adjunct positions just to break the poverty line, wow. you know, to suggest that getting an education in the interest of going off and teaching college is a great idea is, I don't know if that's really true. I don't think it is. I don't think that it's a career that. Well, it's a great career, but there's just there's only so many colleges mm -hmm. and there are only so many positions and there are only so many people to teach. So, you know, at a certain point, it's become saturated. And I think we're just about there, you yeah. know, at this point. So I'm extremely fortunate and grateful to have the position that I have. There's not a college teaching position that I could think of better than that, in, in particular, a part time position. My God, I mean. It's such a great gig with such great opportunities and such great resources and students. And, I, I love teaching it. I really, really do. Nice. So. Well, and not to mention the fact that for most people, when you have to teach somebody something, it makes you dissect and digest it even for yourself because you're kind of going, okay, so what is it that – how do I how do I present this to make it understandable? Mm -hmm. And I have a background. My undergrad is in physics. Mm -hmm. and, and so – understanding how what components do what and trying to impart that to somebody who looks at you with a blank stare like what do you mean and then you go okay wait how <laughs> it was obvious to me but how am i going to break this down and make it clear to you yeah right well and of course i, I think the ball well, i say of course but not of course but I, I do think that in my experience what i've seen people do actually a, a good friend of mine who teaches at the University of Northern Colorado named Jim White. He's a brilliant drummer. We were at North Texas together for a long time. And we were in China a couple years ago teaching, and I was watching him teach. And one of the things I noticed that he did was that, in, you know, yeah, there was all the conceptual stuff, and there was the general stuff about time feel and keeping time, and there was some technical stuff and all that, too. But there were also certain 
very finite concrete things that he would show a drummer, like a very specific like piece of vocabulary, for example, that they could use uh, either in a solo or comping behind other soloists. And those things represented successes and they represented a step toward what he was trying to show them. So they get a little glimpse of what that end goal feels like by succeeding at this little thing, you know, and then that builds on itself. I feel like sort of like put this concept in front of them and the student has to kind of emerge out of the darkness <laughs> little by little until they start to see it, you know, and I thought that was, I don't know if he does that on purpose, but that's what he does. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and I thought it was really brilliant. So I've, I've tried to use that kind of thing myself. As you mentioned, the opportunities for performing, of course, you have played with so many people. I know you've got an upcoming tour with Frank Gambale. You've got projects of your own. You're into the Latin music. You've got a ton of things that you're juggling. So being a part-time teacher, you're mm -hmm. also ongoing performances. Tell us about all that stuff. Sure. I will say that the part-time situation at Berkeley is not vastly different than the full-time position, actually. It's still, it still is time-consuming, and, and in spite of the fact that I'm only there for two days a week, I'm still, I still put in significant time at home that I don't get paid for technically, but whatever. I mean, I'm, I want to get paid for doing a good job, <laughs> not just being there. So I always have a lot of little projects going on. And I guess the sort of silver lining in the, in the nature of the business and the sort of erratic flow or lack of flow, I guess, in projects is that they do tend to be fairly finite and they tend to be small. And so it's like, it's something to do for, you know, that, that you can, it's fairly self-contained and you get to do it and you get that experience and you, put it on your resume or you don't or whatever. And then you're kind of on to the next thing. And then that thing might come back around later, which it hopefully does. But, you know, it's like it's very few like sort of continuous sorts of responsibilities that I have to manage all at the same time. It's usually it's it's Berkeley and then it's this for a couple of weeks and it's that for a couple of weeks and it's this for a month and it's blah, 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 you know, and then those things come to a close and move on to the next. So, yeah, I mean, I've got the Gambali thing coming up with Frank, uh, with uh, with Dennis Chambers. Dennis is playing drums, which is going to be amazing. I, I, I'm really all I have to do is stand there and just sustain a low E and just let them do their thing. I'm sure it's going to be amazing. And and Sean Whalen is playing keyboards. He's an amazing keyboard player too, and piano player. He's a great musician. Uh, I've had a handful of recording projects, um, that I, recording production, mixing and mastering projects. You know, over the course of the last couple of years of a string court sort of a string quartet I guess you'd call it kind of jazz chance cham chamber music kind of thing I guess it's ostensibly a jazz chamber music sort of a thing with a rhythm section and, and a couple of percussionists and a string quartet and accordion and acoustic piano it's really cool this woman named Simon Barron who's a brilliant brilliant musician and composer and a pianist and accordion accordionist accordioner I don't know graduated from Oberlin in Ohio, and she's a really brilliant, really, really brilliant musician. So she's got some cool stuff going on. I engineered the whole thing here, you know, we, the whole thing here in this in my studio, and and then mixed it and mastered it the whole deal. So it was really cool. We had a couple of interesting sort of projects that I'm not really sure what they're going to become of. So I don't even really want to say what they are because they may not pan out, but because it's not up to me. So I just I've done a couple of really good fusion records here. I've done some nice jazz records here. Yeah, the studio, I mean in general the studio is another way that I keep fairly busy for the most part. So because I built the darn thing myself, I might as well use it. <laughs> well my yeah. wife has built it really, but yeah. Well and that ties in with your an, an additional talent you have with electronics. As you were recounting about the preamp, but mm -hmm. you've also were in on the ground floor with trick fish amplification with the whole amplification thing as well, but you're not an electrical engineer. How, how did this happen? I guess I was just recounting this at Federa Camp, and Victor wanted everyone to sort of give a quick synopsis of how, how we came to be affiliated, each of us, you know, became affiliated with Federa. And I guess the short version is that at the time that I was really searching far and wide for a six-string bass that I could... It makes sound as if it's at least in the same ilk as a like a Fender jazz bass. I really, so many of the early six string basses and five string basses were, I think it was largely because of the availability of pickups for them. There's a lack of availability of pickups for them in the 
80s and 90s. You just didn't have the kinds of options that we really needed. And Fidera, I just, without getting into a long, complicated thing, a, a common friend that we had named Ned Mann, who was a brilliant, brilliant bass player, electric and acoustic, and a musician and an engineer. And the guy was amazing and, it, and sadly developed ALS and it killed him a few years ago. It's really sad because this guy was brilliant, just you know, very bright light musically. But he turned me on to Federa. And so I met the guys and they were, you know, they were interested in the same kind of stuff I was. And I helped them implement their new Duncan du dual coil pickups that they had. They weren't, they had them and they weren't certain exactly how to get the most out of them. And so I helped them with that. Just again, using general knowledge. It wasn't really, you know, I, I didn't know everything I needed to know, except I knew what I needed to know to get that result. Then they asked me one day if I wanted to, if I could make a an active circuit. And I said, yes, but I shouldn't. I didn't know, but I said I did. But I knew that I had the resources to find out, and that was the main thing. So I then drew on some of those resources, and ultimately my uncle John, who lives out your way, lives out in, well, now he lives in around Seattle. He lived in Klamath Falls, Oregon for, at the time, I think. It sent him, you know, I told him what I was up to and what I needed to do, and sent him three or four different just circuits that came out of a bone pile somewhere that were this style of thing that, that I wanted. He looked them over and then he called me up one day and he says, all right, I'm going to explain how all this stuff works. And then he basically gave me this crash course on electronic design over the phone. I mean, he's such a brilliant guy. He conceptualizes all those things so well and in such, he can put things in layman's terms so beautifully and eloquently that he just is an extremely effective teacher. And he taught me in just a matter of a couple few days, he had me to where I was at least able to build a two band EQ. And then, you know, and he just pretty much, it was on me to figure out the rest of it. And, and I did. So I figured out the rest of it and got it all to work together and make it, made it sound good and worked with Joe and Vinny and we tweaked it. And, and then they, I built one and they sent it to Japan. And I guess that was the, they, that was their biggest distributor at the time. And they loved it. And so they started buying them from me. Nice. Yeah, so, so I was building them in my apartment in Brooklyn. I was literally making hands, printed circuit boards from scratch in my apartment, which was, oh boy, would that ever be illegal now? It was an yeah. interesting time. And so basically I had to get good at it. And I, I was very fortunate to have the, 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 the ear of uh, Kevin Beller from Seymour Duncan. He's, he runs their custom shop there. He was very helpful to me at least in terms of design. Walter Woods, was a great mentor also. I, I spent a lot of time talking to him on the phone and he was he has such a pragmatic, real world approach of how he just he just does not get hung up about unnecessary details. He he just focuses on results. So uh, I love loved him for that. So yeah, I had a lot of help and I learned what I needed to learn and then and then ultimately, you know, got to where I was making stuff that was working and was pretty reliable and all that. What I didn't understand anything about was manufacturing processes and a lot of stuff that had nothing to do with just designing something, just how to get something made and have it work all the time and how to communicate with manufacturers and blah, 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 because we had a place in New Jersey that was making them for us for a while, so I didn't have to physically hand build them. Mm -hmm. Anyhow, long and the short is that I got all that working and then I met David Yates. Uh, I think you've met David. I mean, David and I worked on the trade fish stuff together too. Sure. He's, he's an electrical engineer. I mean, at the time was with... Uh, Ethicon Endosurgery, he was a medical device guy, and they're a J&J &J company, huge, huge, like Fortune 50 company or something like that, something crazy. When he came on, then all the circuits all of a sudden just kind of like jumped up a few levels of sophistication and, and, and higher performance, quieter, wider bandwidth, lower power consumption, all this kind of stuff. We were able to find a way to actually get them made in a, in a more reasonable way. And so, I mean, they're still, you know, we've always had them made in, in the the factory actually in Pennsylvania. We always did, you know, made in the USA just because, well, for two reasons. Number one, because what we believed in, and number two, because there's not really any benefit to having something that you're only going to sell 200 of a year, you know, made in China or whatever. I mean, if, you know, if you were going to go there, you'd be selling 20,000 a year. It's just, that wasn't us. So mm -hmm. anyway, it all worked out. And that was pretty much that. And then the trick fish thing just, well, the trickfish thing came out of that. Really what, what came out of it first was my rack mount preamp, that MPP-1, MPP-2 that I built, which was a, a, just the culmination of other stuff that I'd already built. Mm -hmm. Stuff I built for other tours. When I went out with the Manhattan Transfer, I built myself a two-channel 
two channel rack preamp because I needed it so that I'd have one for acoustic bass, one for electric bass. And, and then uh, that prototype became another prototype, became the original MPP one, and then that became the ultimate version of the MPP one. And then, and then after that, stop being uh, a reliable or viable source of income just the amount of time it took and the complication of having to buy such expensive parts and keep them on the shelf and never know how many I'm going to sell and not understanding the real formulas for it. I just didn't understand that something that sells retails for $1,500, the parts cost should not be more than 300 okay. You know, that, that's, that's, the, that's the rule of thumb and I was nowhere near that. I was it basically was from a business standpoint kind of a losing proposition. So I just, mm -hmm. I'm a death. But then our friend Richard Ruse, RIP, that's a poor, poor guy that was so sad, but Richard Ruse passed away in, I guess, the fall of 2017. I want to say 17. Yeah, it was really sad. But at any rate, he called me up one day and he's like, hey man, you're not selling those MPP1s anymore. I got an idea. <laughs> so he says, you know, let's, let's make an amp. Let's, Basically, take your MPP one front end. Let's you know, let's find a really good power amp module, and we'll make the thing work as a system. And, and so that was that. So I pretty much, I just I did the you know did all the circuit board layout for the whole thing, and and then David Yates went through and you know they went through the circuit design and refined a few things and got the noise performance even better. I mean, he really went through and crunched numbers hard. He's like, when, you know, he's the guy that knows how to take the, the loose real world stuff and then like narrow it down to like, okay, how can we just like get some math done here? Yeah. And, then, and he did. And man, the thing is quiet and it is, it is really, it really sounds great. And then he handled, of course, all of the systems issues that were way beyond me, the regulatory and, you know, and getting the, getting the amp to cooperate with the preamp and getting the amp to work it. 220 or at 110 and making fixing all the little things that you don't expect you know that come up he i mean he was that was stuff that was way out of my league and, and he, he took care of all of that and we ended up with a really great product and i love it i mean i use it all the time and it's all i use um, i have very little gear for being someone who's so associated with gear i have very little of it. i have like one fretted bass and one fretless bass my daughter has a fender squire and that's that's all the bases i have and i have one amp I still have my Walter Woods that I, I don't, don't take out anymore because I feel like it's become like a museum piece. You know, you can't. They're, yeah. yeah, they're like they're like Sasquatches. They're very elusive, and when you see the little red box, you're kind of going, "Oh, what's this?" <laughs> right. And some people would be more apt to believe it's a Sasquatch than a Walter Woods amp, but they are so special. I mean, you know, you can't. I don't think you can buy them new at all. I don't know if he's even making them anymore. I haven't talked to him in forever, but. So yeah, that's kind of where I've landed on the whole amp thing. I love the trick fish stuff. Anything that I've ever built, I built it because I like it. And so that's why I use it. <laughs> mm -hmm. I've never been the guy to be like, yeah, I'll just use this because they're giving it to me or I'll use, you know, like it just has never been me. It's never cared. I'm a horrible self-promoter and really business person in general. I, I'm so much happier, like in, in that sense, when I'm on the road and I don't like being away from my family, but at least in terms of like just really not having to think about what I do. Mm -hmm. Just roll out of bed and just walk down to the lobby and the tour manager says, go here. And I go, okay. And I just, <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Yeah. So great to not, you know, to just not have to self start at all. But at any rate, yeah. So that was how the trick fish, that was the, that was really how the trick fish thing happened. And honestly, the thing I like most about the trick fish gear is the speakers. I, I, I mean, I, I kind of knew how the amp was going to be because, you know, I was there, but, but when I sent that prototype, David and I came down to something that we felt sufficient for, you know, to give to, to Richard and we gave it to him and he plugged it in and he really liked it and, you know, wanted to change a few things functionally, but loved the sound of it. And then they built the speakers and they did that kind of around the amp. And wow. I mean, that was just what killed me when I, when I heard the whole system, I was like, Oh my God, this is amazing. And there's, you know, and there's slightly different flavors for everybody, you know, mm -hmm. like I love the single 12s. They've got these 408s that are amazing, that are a little different, but still great. They've got these 210, vertical 210s that also are amazing, but are slightly different. But they all give different flavors of this immensely useful, powerful musical tool, you know. It's, it's, it's really, so, yeah, I couldn't be happier about that, really. And so much gear I play through that people just love and I love this. I don't, you know, I don't see why. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I'm not, and I'm not going to say who or what, but I mean, but definitely, there's just sometimes like people rave about something, and I'll plug into it, and I'll be like, man, I, don't, I mean, okay, 
okay. Yeah. It's okay. It's not bad, but it's not like right home about either, you know, so, uh, but everybody has that. The gear chain is so simple. Federa uh, and the bases, Trickfish, amplification, Seymour Duncan pickups quite a bit. Any other elements that were missing there for your sound? Federa strings. Okay. Yeah, that's that's been, gosh, that's, oh my God, I just remembered I need to contact them because I need strings for this tour. Oh gosh. See, I eat strings like at, at, at a tremendous rate of speed. Like, I mean, like crazy. Because I sweat really bad and, and I've just always, my whole life, I've just killed strings in no time flat. No time flat. And I've definitely spent, you know, I've definitely boiled my share of strings in the in the past. And all the people who say that doesn't work, I don't know what they're talking about because it doesn't make them new, but it makes them usable, for, you know, in a pinch. It's a much less than ideal situation, but it, it does work. Mm -hmm. It just does. So whoever says it doesn't, I don't know, I don't know what they're what they're talking about. But but Federa started making strings, and they started, you know, they they unlike a lot of the manufacturers, a lot a lot of bass manufacturers, they they actually make their own strings. I mean, they don't buy them from you know one of the major manufacturers. They just have a guy that has a shop, and he makes strings for them according to their design. Period. That's what it's them. Um, it's you know they they used to have string winding machines in their shop, and they had people standing there winding strings. So they yeah they went hardcore because they just wanted I don't know they just they just they they'd get strings from other manufacturers they'd be good and then they'd be bad and they'd be okay and it was just so inconsistent they had such a hard time with that and I don't know honestly what manufacturers I mean there aren't very many but I don't know who makes their own strings anymore I mean probably Dario GHS and Maybe probably LaBella makes their own. I don't know, but I mean, but you know, I mean, I'm sure there are there are plenty of companies that make their own, but not many bass manufacturers. I don't think if any make their own strings. But they just couldn't get what they wanted, so they just you know, do it you know, themselves. Yeah. And I, so I love it. So that's been great. And so I've had sort of a, a de facto. I mean, there's never been a piece of paper signed, but I've had a de facto endorsement for since they've been making strings, pretty much. And I, I always still feel guilty every time I ask for them because they're like, yeah, I've got to. I mean, like. I've got to go out with Frank Nabali and it's 16 gigs, so I'm going to need 17 sets of strings. <laughs> <laughs> I feel bad, but I can't boil strings on the road, really. So, you know, I just, I, I, it's what it is. I have to start in like a hot pot and like, you know, like a, like a hot plate and just like boiling my strings on that. But. There you go. Well, unless you get a reggae gig where you need dead strings, you, oh, you, yeah. Well, that'd be great. Then I just get myself a set of flats and never change it. There you go. Well, Mike, looking ahead, I know you've got the touring. What projects do you have in mind? Because you've got so much going on. On the books right now, I have the yeah, I have the tour. And when I get back, I've got a good chunk of time to just basically practice, which I need to do because I've got a record coming up that I have to – I'm – co-producing i don't know exactly what the term is but i mean i know that there's a, one of the most brilliant musicians i've ever known a piano player in new york named henry hay doing all kinds of stuff there and he was, in, he was i think he was MDing the david bowie lazarus project and he's the heavy heavy guy and, a, and just a brilliant player and he and i are i guess he's producing and i'm co-producing i don't know how it works but at any rate i just know that we're responsible for putting this project together and then we're going to mix and master it here we're going to record it up in new york somewhere and we're going to mix and master it here at my house but that's going to be with henry and me and a tenor player named dino gavoni who's on the on the faculty at berkeley who i met just through playing channels in, in new york he's a really really amazing tenor player and great writer so he's doing a record in november but that's going to be with jeff tane watts on drums which is the great, you know, the brilliant Jeff Watts, and then this guy Alexander Sipiagin on trumpet, who's another just like top of the heap player. And so that's going to kind of kick my butt. So I'll probably be, you know, I'll have the bow, have the bow out because that's going to probably, I'm sure, be mostly acoustic bass. I always go through these waves, you know, I play a lot of electric and then I play a lot of acoustic. And so it's time to start one of those a lot of acoustic waves. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I'm good and ready for that. 
that record. That's kind of how things go. Um, it's kind of the upside, I guess, of having space in between projects. Uh, I know I've got other stuff. I just can't even think of it. And in general, probably because this is a dynamic kind of situation, the best place if people want to know what you're up to would be to look at Mike Pope Jazz. Dot com, right? Pope or my Facebook page, Mike Pope, is the artist page. And uh, my first, I mean, my personal page, people who know that, that who that are friends with me know about my personal page too. Although I don't, I don't, I've been trying less and less to do professional stuff on there. But uh, it's kind of interesting. I just had a birthday and I, I figured, you know, I got about 400, 400 and some, you know, happy birthdays. And I thought to myself, well, I've got like 4,000 for 4,300 friends or whatever i stopped just at least to just take every request i got and i just stopped doing that so i think i've got like a thousand requests that i mm-hmm. haven't responded to but because i just you know trying to get away from that and more to the professional page but long long and short is i thought well 400 people or whatever it was is probably all the people i need to have on there i don't know maybe i'll pare it down but anyway yes that's that's the way the, uh, the facebook page or my website although hi tank although my website is come here buddy come up here come on Oh, you coming up? Come here. That's a good boy. Oh, oh there he is. He's a good boy. Hi, puppy. He's a good Mike, we appreciate you so much taking time out of your busy schedule because you've got so much going on. This is so great to finally have a chance to catch up, and I'm sure we could go on for a lot longer because there's just so much here. But, folks, make sure you stay on top of what Mike's doing. If you are a prospective student, know that he's at Berkeley. You want to learn bass from Mike after you're seeing what it's like to spend a day with him. If I were younger and I had the opportunity, I'd be thinking, well, I, I, I can see myself doing that. But anyway, folks, you've seen him here. Mike Pope coming to you live on Bass Musician Magazine. <laughs>